Hey everybody, hope you're doing good out there. It's time for another coffee break with Brother Josh. And before uh, we get started on this coffee break, I'd like to thank Sister Cheryl for uh, giving me a signature Brother Josh coffee mug. So now I feel special and I appreciate it, Sister Cheryl. <clears throat> well, today I want to talk a little bit on a subject that I think affects every every one of us and uh, something that maybe we're not considering in our lives. Some of us, I guess, may be. But <clears throat> let me ask you a question. What are you doing in your life that will have eternal value after you die? What is it that you're doing in your life that's going to have eternal value after you die? Well, if you're not saved by the blood of Jesus, that would be the first place to start so that you can have eternal life in Christ Jesus. But those of you out there who are saved, uh, I would like to ask you a question. Is what are you doing? Do, are you one of those who just kind of show up for church once or twice a week or once or twice a month and rarely read your Bible and don't give God much thought throughout the week? Or are you a Christian who has dedicated your life to the Lord and that you're seeking to do His will in your life? You know, life is very short compared to eternity. We know that God is an eternal God and that when we shed this mortal coil that uh, we're going to be in eternity with him. And y'all, eternity is just like it means. It never ends. It's always going to keep going. So the Christian has much to look forward to in this, this eternal state. Let me give you a few facts to help you understand just how short life is. The life expectancy of someone in the U.S. as of 2021 is about 78 years. Now, I know to a teenager or to a, a, a preteen or, or a little kid, that 70, 80 years sounds like a long time. But I'm going to tell you, it is not. It, uh, I turned 41 uh, a few months ago, and I'm going to tell you, it seemed just like that. I hit 41 years of age, and I look back at my life, and I look back at when I grew up in the 90s and in the 80s, it really doesn't seem that long ago but it just flew right past. And I'm sure there's many of you out here listening uh, to this video that think to yourself, man, my life has just flown by. Well, I want you to think about something. That when God first created the earth and man was made, he was made to live for eternity. He was made to live in that righteous state that God had made him for eternity, to have everlasting relationship with, with God our Father. But we know that Adam and Eve sinned and that death come through that sin. And Adam lived 930 years and then he died. 930 years. Now you think about that. Methuselah lived 969 years. And then he died. Methuselah was the oldest man on earth. Moses lived 120 years. Okay? That's older than people live now. But today we're looking at around anywhere from about, oh, 65 to 85-ish. That's right in the area where people start to decline and people start to die. In the U.S., about the death is about 78 years old. And actually, that's pretty good, but still, compared to eternity, man, that's just a drop in the bucket. It's just very, very small. Now, I want to read something to you that James wrote in the Bible about 
life expectancy and about how we spend our lives in James chapter 4 and 13 and I'm, I'm reading it out of the New American Standard Bible. I prefer King James but the New American Standard made it a little easier to uh, understand and it was and it, it's a good translation so I refer to it and a few others every now and again. Uh, James 4 13 through 15 listen to what James says. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow, James says. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while, then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or do that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So James is not putting down or condemning people who are making a living for himself. Not at all. Uh, Paul himself says in some of his epistles that if a man doesn't work, that he shouldn't eat. But what James is, is, is condemning here, what James is putting down, is that there are people, Christians even, that live life only for self. They live life for profit and pleasure. And God's will for their life never enters their mind. They're purely selfish. They really don't give God a thought when it comes to how they should conduct their business, where or what they should do, or the direction that they should take in their life. And this is what James is putting down. This is what James is condemning. He's saying, you know, you say you're going to go do this and you're going to go do that, but your life is so short and you are so just infinitely small compared to God and his sovereignty. He said, boasting in these things is useless. And when he starts talking about that vapor and that mist, let me kind of give you an illustration of what he's talking about. Is in the mornings when I drive to work, there is a mist out across the fields when I'm driving there. And that mist comes in the morning. But did you know that when I drive home in the evening, that mist is gone? I spend eight hours at work, and I see it when I come in, and when I leave to go home, it's done disappeared. So he's saying, your life is very, very short especially compared to all those that have come before you, all those that will go after you, your life is very short. And so what he's saying is that these people pursue worldly success, not godly success. These people are worried about big houses, nice cars, they're wanting fame, they're wanting high society friends, and they're getting all that at the expense of not having God's will in their life. You know, I think so many times the people that I have known in the past and, and people even now that they work their life away. They, they expend themselves to a frazzle working 60, 70 hours a week. They don't have time for friends. They don't have time for family. They don't have time for God. But they got money. They got a nice house they can brag about or a new truck. But I got to ask you this question. You're going to have all those things here on this earth. And I'm not, I'm not mad or messed up that someone's got a nice house or truck. But what I'm saying is like what James says, at what cost are you having these things? Are you pursuing God's will in your life or are you pursuing your will so that you can have those things? Now, sometimes God will, God's will in your life, you'll have those things. 
and God will provide a nice, comfortable living for you. But then there are other times you may not have those things. And I'll go into that in just a moment. Uh, let me reach over here. Listen to what 1 John 2 and 15 says. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. Listen here. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, and that word lust there just means desire. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. The world passes away. Think about it. People have just worked themselves to death so that they can have a, a new car, a new house, certain clothes, a piece of jewelry, and all these things. And you know, many of those cars and houses that people work so hard to have are rusting in a junkyard, are falling down, uh, dilapidated, no longer cared for. And this person spent so much time and so much effort to have those things. People work that they can have huge bank accounts when they retire. And I'm not against you having a retirement. But they die and all that money goes to their children or to their grandchildren. And their grandchildren and their children get to enjoy it. And the person who worked so hard for it didn't. So I want you to think about this is what are you doing here on earth that's going to have an eternal reward in heaven? What are you doing here right now that God is going to say, well done, my good and faithful servant for? Uh, listen to what Mark 8 and 36 says. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? He says, what good is it if you have everything that you can lay your eyes on, every wonderful thing that you hear about, you can have, uh, just if you can have all this stuff and you lose your own soul, what good is it? It's not good at all. All right, now listen here. Let's look at Paul. I want to talk to you just shortly, and I, I'm fixing to end this video, about what godly success is. Because there's so much talk about success on the internet, YouTube, TV, you name it. Success, success, success. Five steps for you to be successful. Three steps to be a millionaire. If you want to impress your friends, you do this thing here. Say this here. You, you see it everywhere. But I'm not, wor I'm, not, I'm not concerned with what worldly success is, what some philosophy of success is. I want to know what godly success is. That's what I'm worried about. That's what I'm concerned with. So listen to 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8. This is Paul. Paul's about to die. Uh, it's not going to be long, and he's going to be going to be with the Lord. And he writes this letter to Timothy, his son in the faith. He says, for I am now ready to be offered. He's talking about his death. And the time of my departure is at hand, talking about his soul departing from his body. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. So I want to tell you, the success that God wants is for you to fight a good fight of faith, to finish the course he's given you, and to make sure that that faith is in you and in you strong when you depart. Finish your course. Well, what's your course? Well, number one, we know the course is keeping the faith. 
staying in the faith of Jesus Christ. But God has a special will for each and every one of your lives out there. I don't know God's will for your life. It's something you have to find. But if you want to be successful in God's eyes, you got to do his will for your life, not your will, not mama's will for your life, not daddy's will for your life, not brother, sister, friend, wife, husband's will for your life, God's will for your life. And that is where you're going to find true success. And if you do that, I promise you that you will be storing up treasures in heaven and that there will be an eternity to enjoy those rewards that God has given you. Well, I hope you've enjoyed our coffee break. This is Brother Josh saying goodbye.